Thank you. Thank you again for joining us. This is our very closing special um, speaker. Um, I'm really proud to introduce a professor and dean, Andrew Dillon, of the School of Information at the University of Texas. And um, I, I think he's going to bring some uh, new perspectives about the ecology of information to talk about. Uh, you know, part of what we try to do and we need your suggestions about this, is we try to bring people um, who don't normally talk to the healthcare system. We need new perspectives. We need people from Europe. And thank you to our <laughs> the, the Germans. And uh, as you know, it was wonderful to have Professor Masao Horibe here as well. Um, so we want, we want people from everywhere, from different countries, from different perspectives. And so Andrew is, uh, I'm just going to, I already made enough jokes about him being Irish and, and, uh, and a computer scientist and a psychologist, which I love because I'm a psychiatrist and an analyst. So, um, so uh, please welcome Dean Andrew Dillon. I can't actually see my slides, so I don't know what I'm, what I'm talking Are they, uh, is there a slide up? Okay. This is going to be almost impossible, impossible for me to remember what I'm talking about. So I'll tell you what, I'm just... Well, for 10 seconds, I could get my own laptop up, and I'll have the same thing. Bear with me. Interesting ergonomic issue. I hadn't thought of uh, my own visual sightline for the. Um, for the uh. Okay, so now I'll have to remember to advance them at the uh, at, at the same time. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and, and uh, thanks, Deb, for the invitation. As Deb said, this is uh, not my usual audience. Um, but you know, everyone, everyone here has a Deb story, so I've got to get my Deb story out first as well. So, uh, I first met Deb when we had a special guest speaker come to our school uh, to talk about what's a very hot issue for us in the information fields, health informatics. And the committee had found what we thought of as sort of premier scholar uh, in North America to come and talk to us. And they came and they, we fated them and it was a nice event. And, a large crowd in our conference room, and uh, the speaker started talking. Now, there's a, there's, a, there's a, you know, I didn't know Deb at this time, but you know, after about five minutes, I heard someone from the back saying, no, no, not under HIPAA. And then the speaker sort of proceeded a bit more, and I said, no, that's not right. And, I thought, and I'm so, Now, there's a protocol in academia, which is when people give a speech, you sort of wait to the end to ask questions. Uh, now, sometimes the speaker will say, uh, well, they'll invite questions, as I do, actually, while I'm talking, so you feel free to interject with me. But it wasn't, this didn't quite cover it, because Deb wasn't offering questions, she was offering contradictions. And, uh, and I, I remember looking around and thinking, who is that woman? And um, so afterwards, I met her, and I, and, uh, I learned a little bit about the story, and I, I said to my committee later, I said, you know, it's odd that this strange woman in the audience seemed to know much more about this stuff than anybody else in the room. We should have really have got her to give the talk. And uh, I feel that way ever since about Deb. She's totally turned my head around on privacy, which I'd sort of known about and I've been concerned about because I do a lot of work in designing information systems and we, we are concerned with security. Uh, but what I've really become concerned about is the experience of privacy and the sense that uh, the real world behaviors of humans are so poorly catered for uh, with any provisions we put in to help them with privacy, I just figured we've got to do something about that. So part of what I'm doing in the school, and I'll talk a little bit about today, is starting a new program uh, to try and change that. But anyway, I come from a school of information, which is sort of, um, it changed, great. Um, you won't be able to read that, and it doesn't matter. Uh, let me just say, I'll, we've got 22 faculty. We're the smallest graduate program, uh, smallest school, actually, independent school at the University of Texas, where everything is usually very large. We're actually quite small and proud of it. The interesting keynote there is that we've got 22 faculty with 12 different disciplinary backgrounds. So I'm a psychologist, but I've got industrial engineers, computer scientists, anthropologists, historians, philosophers, library scientists, English scholars, 
Uh, I've got everybody except a lawyer, actually. We, 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 do, we, do, we do have some quality control. And, um, so, uh, uh, and the idea is that we're trying to create this graduate program where we bring in people from very, very different backgrounds who are obsessed with what's happening in the world and what's happening in the world of information technology in particular and how it can advance the human condition. I, I aspire to nothing less than that, and that's what we're trying to do. And the students we bring in uh, end up getting careers. They come often from liberal arts backgrounds, but they're interested in getting a job. So they come to us. And, uh, so, so, uh, and so, we, we can so almost guarantee them work, because uh, the, the skill set they get with us, which involves being able to organize information, being able to design interfaces to information, and to be able to understand how information technology can be implemented in an organization so it actually works, uh, these are very, very high commodity skills, and the job titles they get really don't make sense because they change so rapidly. And every year I survey the job title that our graduates, and they all, they all get jobs. Okay, and I survey the title, and it's just one big long tail distribution. You know, there are singletons everywhere, people called you know, a company ontologist, an information architect, a user experience specialist, a competitive intelligence analyst. I mean, they each sort of go in and... They're almost invited to label their job description the way they want according to the company and the context they're in. And I think this is sort of fantastic in one way, but it's worrying for some people who aren't quite sure what does it actually mean about your school and what do you do. Um, and, and, you know, and I sort of get that. And I worry about it too. Um, but let me say, well, here are our core principles. So uh, this is a graduate program, and this is what we stand by. We think humans are at the center of the information lifecycle. Not the technology, not the data. In fact, I draw a distinction between data and information, and I want to make that distinction quite explicit here. It's an old one in the field. We, most people worry about data, and they use the terms interchangeably, but data only becomes information when a human can make sense of it. When there's meaning imbued and extracted from the data, then it becomes information, then it informs. And it's not information before that, it's just data. And this obsession with big data, we need to get over it. Just get over it, okay? It's there, it's come, it's here, it's not going away. Let's worry about how we can extract value out of it. But this value has to be mediated. So we believe that all IT must serve the needs of humans, okay? And this is, you might think, well, that's obvious, isn't it? Well, not if you've used most information technology. You realize it's not designed at all well to serve the needs of humans. We also believe that access to information, and we mean free access to information, is a bedrock of a civic democratic society, and this must be protected. This absolutely must be protected at all costs because there are interests there that don't want that to be the case. We've always had it. This country was the origin of the public library system. People don't quite realize that. That system is in very real danger, but it's one of the few places, the few places in this country where people who have otherwise no ability to get on the internet can walk in and get that access. They can go in and get information about their voting rights. They have free space that they can use to organize and have events for themselves. That's an incredible concept. Yet most people have no idea that it's there, and they certainly have no idea that slowly but surely that infrastructure is being eradicated in this country due to lack of funding and sort of budgets that make it impossible to maintain that kind of service. There's nothing easily out there to replace it, and I think we need to cherish those values and remember them, keep them, guard them, and move them forward into this new age. Also, you know, I'll just run through this quickly. Information systems should augment human and organizational capabilities. I mean that, you know, in, in the niche that we're talking about now in the world is technology, um, and I could spend an hour just talking about this alone, but there's been several ages of, of technology, information technology. And somewhere around the mid-80s, the processing of numbers dropped and the processing of words increased. And that was actually a very, very interesting change in sort of computational resource use. Now we're moving on again to mixed media, audio, video. The old notions of computing, and particularly computer science, as I sort of annoy most of my colleagues in computer science, there wasn't a computer science department in this country until 1962, and Purdue formed it. And I said, by 2062, I don't think there'll be many computer science programs left. And they go, that's impossible. Every university has a computer science program. So every university has many, many programs which are dynamic. And the epistemology shift, you put a building around a subject, that doesn't actually protect the subject. <laughs> and uh, computer science might be sort of a linchpin uh, discipline of our time. But in fact, what we see increasingly is that computer science is falling behind the real pressing design and use needs that most of us are worried about uh, just from our own lives, and particularly what we see as the lives of our children coming behind us in the world that they're going to occupy. We have computer science students who come to us because this is the stuff they want to study. You're always going to need the technologists, 
But what we think you need is a whole new discipline of information professionals who are actually concerned with human values and implementing those human values in ways that work in real systems. So they have to actually have some technical skill, otherwise they're just going to be a voice in the wilderness. But it's not the most important thing for them to have. And we believe that kind of education is, is sort of vital here. But just in parallel with that idea of shifting from text to word, we've also moved from just calculation. You know, computation has moved from being a calculation-based activity to one that we believe is about augmentation. So now that you enable tasks to be performed that couldn't have been done before, and it's not just about the number crunching. I mean, we've known that for a long time too, but we're only slowly seeing that play out in, in the real world. And here, particularly for this audience, I want to emphasize that we, we, our idea of a notion of a high quality information infrastructure raises very deep ethical questions about who owns what, who has the rights to what, privacy of course is what this audience is particularly concerned with. Access alone is a huge one for me because we really are creating a world with multiple tiers. And it's very easy for us, particularly in North America, to forget that the majority of the world have yet to get access to the internet. We don't think that. We think the internet's everywhere. And you know, if you're a member of somebody, if you're, you know, if you're traveling and you, you're online, you're everywhere. That's true. But for the majority of people on this planet, that's a fictional existence that's way beyond them. They don't have the society, they don't have the infrastructure, they don't have the resources, they don't have the money. It's just not there. But they're coming. And they are going to come big time, very, very quickly, like a tidal wave. And when that community of users ends up on the web, our version of it, which is a highly English language specific notion of what content on the web should be like, is going to be seriously challenged. And you're going to look at an internet in 20 years' time or 30 years' time, which we believe is going to be very, very different in makeup and content than the, the kind of uh, information resources we've sort of adopted and become so used to and taken for granted now. They're going to be challenged. So there's a couple of narratives that flow through all this notion of data and access. And you'll hear these sort of nuggets and quotes all the time. Look how many billion... Oh, well, I didn't actually fast forward, did I? How many slides ago did I leave you? I can't quite remember. <laughs> oh, there, where the um, you know, how many billions of exabytes, gigabytes? You can't even measure this stuff. You know, people will quote you numbers for how much new data is out there. And it's sort of a nonsense. It's, it's, you know, it's a great dirty secret that we don't actually know, but we sort of make estimates. But it doesn't sort of matter because it's not the precise amount, it's the scale that matters. So if you take a number like 200 billion, that is equal to 12 stacks of paper that would reach from here to the sun and back. Okay? That's coming out every year. Okay? Now, of course, we're not printing it all out, although Unfortunately, one of the most successful information technologies of our time is the printer and the photocopier. It's only in the last couple of years we've actually seen a down, downward curve in the consumption of wood for conversion to paper. We've been eating the planet alive for the decades preceding that. It's just about tailed off, but it's still extraordinarily high. That's also you know, three million times the amount of words in all the books ever written in the history of our fine species. You know, that's what's happening in a year. I mean, this is incredible. And even if that's not quite right, it's near enough right that it should sort of surprise you. And then you'll get the new gods, uh, you know, people like Eric Schmidt of Google who will say, you know, from the dawn of civilization until, say, pick a year, we produced about five exabytes of data. Now we can do that in two days. So when you think about things, and I'm not totally sympathetic to the numbers, but you need to understand we are living in real time through a shift in our culture and our world that is unprecedented since Gutenberg. And I have to say that again and again to people because we've become lazy about that. We take it for granted. We sort of live it and think, yeah, yeah, they're big numbers. These are not just big numbers. These are phenomenal shifts in human behavior. And sometimes people get it wrong. Steve Jobs, most famously for me, believed that nobody reads anymore. Uh, this is clearly not the case, okay? It's clearly not the case. In fact, if you look at the average uh, American adult and their consumption of text alone, we seem to be reading more now than we ever were. Now, we might be reading less high-quality output, perhaps. <laughs> with, uh, but the number of words, if you just measure it in those terms, we are reading like, uh, like nothing else. I look at my own kid. His homework is on. So he's in a public school system in Texas. 
And his homework is all media-based. They don't, you know, the, the math teacher has them watch videos at night and then come with questions into class. He doesn't actually sit there and, or stand there and teach. That's, that's not what teachers do anymore, apparently. Uh, you know, but all their homework is online. They write and submit online. That world has just happened. And the idea of sitting down and, and reading a book, I mean, a book, uh, it's sort of odd. So odd, in fact, that two weeks ago I gave an interview to a, a, a Chinese radio station because they contacted me because there's some interest in China, a government mandate to enforce uh, compulsory readings of novels uh, at school because they are worried that their whole society is just shifting away from traditional literacy to, to new forms. And they think this might actually be a problem. Um, I thought that was kind of an interesting observation. But, I'm going to situate this a little more clearly by giving you um, a 25,000 year history of information in three slides. Okay? I can do this. <laughs> you can grasp this. Okay? It's possible. So I've talked about all the new stuff. It's not all about the new. There's something underlining us as a species that is sort of key to understanding how we deal with the issues that we're facing at the moment. So I would argue that you could go back to to 15,000 BC, and those cave paintings were not artwork, okay? It wasn't somebody's idea of how to window dress the cave. This really was, uh, this was actually a signal to people in the tribe that if you were in this region during certain times, this is where you will find food. This is where you can hunt, this is where the animals were. This is a signal, a record left by one group of humans for another. It was a very, very early form of information dissemination. 3,500 years back, we can trace early writing. Largely a form of counting, the idea of notches and creation of sort of numbering systems which could be recorded to dictate ownership and particularly size of counts of army, cattle, possessions, property. 2,500 BC, the first library, okay, in Iraq. That's kind of interesting, wouldn't you say? Uh, 2,000 BC, the first catalog. Now I tell you that because it didn't take long in human terms for us to move from actually having libraries to then realizing we need a form of representation to tell us what we've actually got. Those catalogs were the first example of metadata. Okay, the current term, we use it all the time. It's, it's got thousands of years of history, us as a species. This is how we evolve. This is how we record. This is how we share. We've been doing it. We've always been doing it. I said I'd do it in three slides with the implication that it would be fast. I'll speed up. I won't go through all of those. You can sort of see them. Along comes writing, early, early alphabet forms, first bound books, 100 years BC. Bound books, okay? A library to the Library of Alexandria, woodblock printing, preceding Gutenberg by at least 700 years, similar ideas the Chinese had on wood. Okay. Oh. <sighs> Can I just give that to somebody? Um, and just say, when, 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 I, when I go forward, just, just flick forward. So you should now be at 700 AD. Does that make sense? Yeah, speed and time up, Deb. Come on. 700, okay. What, I'm, what I would want me the point of there is that everybody ties the Gutenberg Revolution very much to a particular location and time. But in fact, that knowledge itself had, had precedence. Every technology we have has a precedent, okay? And often we don't recognize it. So the technologies that will be here in 30 years' time have already taken their roots in some ideas now, okay? I also should point out for the... Uh, the um, the benefits of uh, the lawyers in the room that 400 AD we had the first copyright case. This is actually uh, <laughs> in, in, in Ireland where, um, uh, of course, it, was, it has to be, you know, the master race, we did it. Um, <laughs> copying a Bible. And an argument came up between the copier and the original Bible owner about who owned the copy. Now, uh, a decision on that one is pending. Uh, <laughs> But it does, wouldn't you like a slice of those billable hours? I know you would. Uh, uh, but you know, it does actually uh, portend to the sorts of issues that we face now about who owns what, who has the rights, who can share this stuff. I mean, you know, we, we hear a lot that teenagers these days have no respect for property. Once it's online, it's fair game for you. It's actually a bit more complicated than that. But these issues about who owns what, particularly now when we at the drop of a button can make an identical copy. The idea of ownership is, uh, what exactly are you owning? 
is, is, is paramount. But, you know, this is centuries-old discussions. And I can go forward, you know, the digital classification system, another form of metadata, using the word digital there in its numeric sense, not its, uh, the sense it tends to be used these days. First daily newspaper in Germany, 1650. Uh, we may soon be witnessing the end of the daily newspaper. That's quite a possibility in our lifetime, uh, particularly the paper form, at least, anyway. First photograph, 1814, mechanical typewriter, 1714, and Deb, if you would. Into the 20th century and then great acceleration, okay? First TV broadcast. The ballpoint pen actually was a remarkable invention, 1938. An ability to write with something portable, small, you carry with you, works every time reliably. Um, you know, not, no more ink bottles to be sort of exploiting. Man. Photocopiers, oh, you know, we had cell phones in 1947. Now, the origin, the origin of the cell phone now, you know, it was that size, but the battery pack went on your back, that sort of idea. But, uh, you know, it wasn't quite the slim form factor that Apple have made us uh, love and adopt. But it, you get the idea. We've had a browser, you know, browser wars going back 20 years now. In 1993, I remember the first time I used Mosaic. I mean, some of you will... The generation, my son's generation, he calls these the bad old days. He said, Dad, what was it like in the old days before the web? I said, you know, it was a bit like it is now. Um, um, he, doesn't like, he doesn't like that. He doesn't like that. That's impossible for him to get his head around. Okay? Uh, you know, and, and then you can pick up all these other things. I just got some examples. Facebook is now over 10 years old. You get this push for the iPhone 2007. I thought that was sort of a killer app. You know, Google coming along with its print library. For people in my world, that was sort of an important and interesting and thorny set of issues associated with that iPad 2010. I have a sort of a little running gag with my faculty. I say, what's been the killer technology of the last five years? And I didn't put one in because we don't think there has been one. You know, the shift to the cloud has been enormously important, but there isn't one technology that stands out that way. We've just refined these variants. Now, that could just be, it's just a five-year window in 25,000 years. What are you worried about? Uh, or it could signal something else, which is that this kind of history is often a history of the technology not the history of the behaviors that were changed and the social structures that were formed and enabled as a result of this. We may now be at a point where we are so immersed in this stuff that the killer technology, the thing that, that people dream of creating and getting rich on, is no longer really viable. That there are, we're at a maturing stage of looking at an information infrastructure emerging around us and that it won't be tied to a single tool of technology. Perhaps, I don't know. Uh, Dev, if you were the next one, please. What's coming? Who knows what's coming? You know, people tell you what's coming really haven't a clue, okay? So let me tell you what's coming. <laughs> we think in about five years, oh, I don't. Cisco thinks this. And if Cisco thinks it, I tend to think there's probably some grain of truth in some of it anyway, at least. 50 billion intelligent devices connected to the Internet as sensors. Now, that's more than people. That's growing at a rate faster than people. Think about that. What's that world going to look like? It's not going to look like the world of today. Certainly not by the world of 10 years ago. There's no turning this back, okay? So we can argue it. We can't, you know, rally the troops and say, we want to go back to the good old pre-days. It's not going to work like that. There'll be hiccups along the way. But I don't actually know what this means, but I do think it's profoundly important. Something's going to happen. Our world is going to look different, and it's going to get designed for us. You know, architect, my, 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 my colleagues in architecture tell me that the 21st century is the century when the majority of human beings on this planet will live in an urban space. Okay? When I first heard that, I thought, oh, that's kind of profound. But then I actually, I actually don't think it's that profound anymore, really. I think more profoundly is that in the 21st century, most people are going to live in an information space that's unlike anything that's existed on this planet before. And that's the real architecture that we have to worry about. And that's the architecture of information that I'm so obsessed about. Next one, Deb, please. So if I could sort of sum up that, that history, I would just say you need to understand any current technology that we're using is really just part of this trajectory that had the formulation of language into writing, into printing, into computing, into sensing. This is, they're all part of this trajectory, of this existence that we're in, which places human beings in a world mediated by some form of information. We've moved from calculation to organization. I mentioned this. We're moving, obviously, into a mobile kind of world, Adoption can often lag, and often, not always, but one thing that's almost certain, any successful technology has unintended consequences. Any one of them. There's always some use that's made of it by people that were not intended to use it that way by the designers. This is just a fact of the human condition. 
It's actually a beautiful fact of the human condition, but it can be a worrying one when you're trying to predict what people will do. I would argue we're at a huge moment of change in the ecology of information, a very significant moment of change. We're in it. That's what's exciting. Uh, we're in it. That's what's frightening. Uh, uh, we're in it, and others are going to join us in it as well. So, and that's really going to prove very, very interesting for, for us as we go forward. But your experience of life, life, not just your job, pilot, your very life on this planet in the next few years is going to be shaped as you move through this space. So this real-time adoption of big data, the ability to sense everything and record it, and then use that to redesign almost what will appear to our senses be almost real-time, the world around us is going to create an information architecture that uh, changes lots of behaviors, changes lots of jobs, changes education. It could change government. It certainly could change all kinds of practices, professional practices, the ones you're in for sure. It'll change our culture. It'll change the way we govern ourselves. And if we're not careful, we will be radically changed by it, by people who control information, structures, flows, in this space. And that is what worries me enormously. There is very little voice given to an alternative perspective to the dominant technological forces that largely are shaping this world and are hungry for it. And they are aggressively hungry for it. And along with that will be part of your existence, part of your privacy, ownership of your identity, ownership of your records, practices that you routinely perform. They're all going to be morphed and controlled by other people. Okay. And I think we need to find ways of dealing with that. And I mean that. We need to find ways as a country, as a species, to understand that this is a different time. A different time for us and certainly a different time for our children. And the weapons we have to, to fight this stuff, and I don't want to cast it too strongly as a sort of a battle, but I think it is a battle. I think we're about to enter a battle, and I think we're not well armed. We're not well armed at all. So I want to do something about that. Um, Next one, Dan, please. This is one for all the, for all the doctors in the room. Uh, I love this picture. I, I make my students look at this. And, um, cause just because it's a nice picture, really, in a way. But uh, the other is to point out, when x-rays were first discovered, it took a while to figure out how to apply them. Uh, I, there's a lesson in that. Any technologies that we're creating, it's going to take a while before we really know how to get the best out of them. More so... With x-rays now, even a skilled doctor has to learn the skill of how to read it. It's not obvious to anybody looking at that x-ray what's going on. But a doctor with experience can learn to identify something of note in that space. Same visual display to all of us. The NOAA has a different interpretation of it. This is going to characterize so many of your interactions going forward. Thanks, Deb. Next one. I'm a psychologist, so I want to remind you, all this breakneck speed, all this rapid technology, we have a natural bottleneck, and it's our brain. Okay? There is a limit to what we can do. I'll just, for a second, remind you of, of one of your limits. So, um, Next one, Deb, please. Uh, this is a totally fictional number, okay? but, but it doesn't matter. The point is, is accurate. The processing speed of computers has just rocketed up, up, up and up and up. Now we'll argue about when it tails off or what the cost per unit will be. Forget that. Generally, processing speed has inexorably risen. Humans' processing speed is inexorably flat. Okay? Okay? You know, I'm not, I'm not an evolution denier. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that, you know, we don't change that much. You know, the working memory my father had is pretty much the working memory capacity my son will have. Now, some of that is genetic, unfortunately, but, uh, you know, uh, the other part is just we don't change that much. You know, humans are pretty constant, okay? It's the technology that's rapidly shifting around us. Uh, next one, please, Deb. Only I lied a bit about your processing speed. It's not exactly flat. Um, it's, it's going down. Um, and this is predictable. Okay, now, don't worry too much. I mean, the bad news is if you're a gaming enthusiast, by the time you're post-30, you cannot compete competitively in games. There's just something about your raw processing speed. You're going to be outdone. It's just like the Olympics. You know? You're not going to be a world-class sprinter at the age 45. Well, you might be world-class for 45-year-olds, but let's face it, the Olympic champion's not going to worry too much about you. You are going downhill at predictable speed. Now, I can pick processing speed. I can pick perception. I can pick any attribute of the cognitive system. These things are invariant. And I heard a comment yesterday that, well, all studies of psychology are all about just... Um, 
white uh, undergraduates in America. And I, I get the point. I do get the point. I've taught some of those people. Uh, I, and, and it's a frightening prospect that they might be representative of, uh, of the whole human species. But uh, that's, it's not entirely true. There are, there are attributes of our architecture which are universal. That people, no matter where they're born, where they grow up, they have very much more similarity than difference. And this is just wired into us. It's the way we are. But what's also wired into us is this, this sort of decline in process. Now, you can look at that and say it's very worrying. You can look at it and say we're going to need these kind of medical interventions. All true. I actually think I look at this and say what's interesting in America where we know the demographics uh, of the population and what, what aging groups will be where they are at a certain period of time. We need to design technologies to augment that very predictable decline. I mean, nobody thinks... It's anything to wear glasses, but you're wearing glasses, I'm wearing spectacles because of a predictable decline in my, my visual system. Okay, and this is nothing I can do to fight it. Some of us start earlier, I've worn, I've worn glasses for 30 years, some start later, but there's a sort of a general predictable decline. And so we found a way of working with that. But we need to find it for everything. And we need to find it for a generation of people who will have been so used to technology, they're not going to accept the fact that they can't use the newer forms of technology. They want the technology to augment their predictive loss of memory, their lifestyle choices, they want, they, you know, they want to be able to manage their world still through technology, not give it up at a certain point. Who ever heard of anybody? I gave up computers, I got kind of tired of them in my life, and it hasn't happened. I mean, I'd love it to happen, I'd like to be the first person who could manage to do it, but uh, it, it ain't going to happen. Okay? So that's um, a segue into that, just to say the backdrop of all this is that there's some science here, there's some predictability about the human species that we should always be aware of in our discussions about it. Next slide, please, then. And, of course, it's hugely overwhelming, and your capacity to process this stuff is limited, so we need to design around. And, in fact, this tremendous advantage taken of you by the lack of ability you have to process information. Any of the forms that you sign when you upgrade your software is a classic, cynical manipulation of your limited processing power and, let's face it, your threshold for boredom uh, <laughs> in doing it. So I hear people just click through. They click through. And we've got, it's now cynically understood that you can, you, can, you can just assume a certain percentage of people don't care what you put in. You know, and by the way, every week I'm going to upgrade this and charge you $5. You know, yeah, yeah, I'll sign that. Sign it. Sign it away. We just sign this stuff away because of, we're being exploited in this very, very predictable sense. Uh, next slide, Deb, please. Now, in the privacy one, which I do want to bring this to, and I promised I would actually talk about privacy at some point, um, uh, um, is that, you know, we, we're all very familiar with the, the Pew studies, and the Pew studies are actually are fantastic in a way. I mean, I, it saves me having to do any surveys of my own. Uh, I just see there's a new one out. Oh, and I look at that. And if you look at these sorts of data points, they're probably too tiny for you to sort of realize. You'll get the sense that humans are quite complicated in their attitudes towards privacy. Uh, I would like to say we're sophisticated. But, uh, so people obviously want to protect their social security number, but if you go to the things they don't care about, the media you like, your political views, what your, you and your friends like, many people don't think that's information that should in any way, you should care if somebody else knows it. I care enormously. Anybody knows what I like. I don't want people to know what I've searched. And it's not for any nefarious activities I get up to online, but they're my searches. I get annoyed with targeted ads that clearly come in because they're based on some model that says, well, if I clicked on this, I might do that. Or oh, the more worrying ones, if I've looked for a certain kind of illness, information about an illness, information about a, a, a treatment, that triggers all sorts of other changes in my information experience. And then you have to worry, where else does that go? Who's getting it? We heard about the wellness programs yesterday, and I knew there was a reason why I had no interest in participating in my wellness program at UT. <laughs> but now I'm actually certain I know why, and, I, I can, and I'm quite prepared to agitate back at UT that there's something we need to be very, very careful with. But only by agitating are you going to get change. I have to tell a funny story. After talking to Deb a couple of times, I realized next time I went to my doctor, I, you know, they always ask the same stuff, and you're signing multiple things. One of them was my uh, ethnicity. And I said, why do you want to know that? And they just said, oh, it's just on the form. And I said, no, no, really. Why do you actually care what my ethnicity is? 
And I couldn't get an answer, so they sent somebody out from the back. They must have this person who's in there for troublesome patients sent, <laughs> sent by Deb Peel. And, uh, and, and this person came out and said, oh, look, this is just something that the government has mandated. And I thought, well, the government wants to know my ethnicity? I said, this is crazy. So I just put down other. You know, I, thought, I, so I, just, I throw some noise into that data wherever you, wherever you can. I think it is... But it's just, again, this idea of what's yours, what, and what do they do with this stuff? You, don't, you have no idea. Anyway, that was just a sort of a segue. The problem with these surveys is, okay, our experience is dynamic. The attitudes change. You cannot build science out of surveys. Uh, I don't mean to be cruel to any of my social psychology friends who do that for a living all the time, but you cannot get enough knowledge out of a survey. There's just too many biases, too many unknowns, too many contingencies between what people say and what they do. We have a lot of models that talk about the amount of you know, variance that's explained by responses on an intention to do something. And people say, I, I, I will do this, or I'm going to do this by a certain time. You can guarantee, almost with mathematical certainty, a, a proportion of them that will not do that, despite everything they've said. Because our attitudes, it's not because they're liars. They actually believe it when they fill in the survey that that's what they're going to do. But life gets in the way, and they do other things. Uh, next slide, please, please Deb. Um, and so I do think that let, there is a point to all this, let me say, there is a point. Uh, I think the scholarship on privacy is really in its infancy, and it's lacking. Um, now, what's special about our program is I'm a big believer that no one discipline knows this stuff. I mean, there isn't a discipline for privacy. There isn't a discipline for designing a better information world. Um, so as a result, we have to create one. And I don't care if it outlives me or doesn't outlive me, but we have to create it and do some good right now. What I find interesting in Solovey's work is that if you don't even know the book Understanding Privacy, it was written by a professor in Georgetown. I highly recommend it because it's a very interesting way of saying, look, most of the privacy discussions are obsessed about what is and what is not privacy. And it's, after a while, it just becomes a game of definitions. And he looked at it and said, you know, the trouble with privacy is it's, it's nuance. It means different things in different contexts, and we have to kind of understand it in terms of information flow. And I thought, well, for an information guy, that made a lot of sense to me. So I'm thinking, okay, so now there actually are some lawyers I should be reading. And so this is one of them. But I think this work is out there, and I think it's sort of interesting. I think it's taking it outside law. It's bringing in psychology. It's bringing in philosophy in ways that are helping create a different kind of understanding of privacy. And that's what I want to do with our school. Now, I'll end with a sort of a positive note, and I might have to ask you to scoot several slides forward, actually. Um, what are we doing about it? Is that the one there? What are we doing about it? Says, yeah, okay. There's a model of technology innovation which assumes, and this would be sort of the Wall Street Journal approach to it, um, that you create the economic incentives, get out of the way, and you reward those that innovate, okay? And the winners will, will grab the glory. That way, because the incentives are in place, people will be encouraged to design. Um, and that's how we've largely got these killer technologies over the years, okay? I actually think that's deeply, deeply flawed because we're on a hiding to nothing if that's how we encourage the development of the world. It leaves out any consideration of human and social benefit. And the, the believers will say the incentive model takes that into account because people won't be successful if they don't create things that have human benefit. Who are they kidding? Who are they kidding? That isn't how it works. Lots of technologies out there have zero benefit for most of us, but they're making somebody a killing, okay? And that's uh, not a good model for technical development. So I want to actually challenge that incentive model and say there's got to be a different way of creating. And partly I do it by just shocking people into understanding that the world we're creating now is one we're creating and shaping ourselves. And if we don't take a stand in it, our values get lost and get buried. And that's why I think this group, this movement, what Deb's done with uh, the privacy issues and health, is just, it's irreplaceable. Uh, it's, it's amazing to me that it, take, it took one passionate person in Austin to do this, to launch this herself just out of the belief of it because others weren't doing it enough. Uh, I just, that tells me, well, we can shape this stuff. We can get in there. And that's why I want, our, our school does work, does sponsor this summit. That's why I'm happy to be uh, uh, actively involved with, with PPR because I really believe in, in what we're doing and I believe it has, it has huge impact for, for our world going forward. Our school actually pushes a different kind of incentive model. We're trying to educate a different kind of professional. They'll be technically savvy, but they'll be compulsorily force-fed 
social science methods and research and theories and ethics and philosophy. And they're going to come out with a different mindset about what they want to do. Sure, some of them will go straight to industry and earn $100,000. Good luck to them. They'll be getting a letter from me asking for a donation very shortly. Uh, but there are others who will go and they'll work in the not-for-profits. They'll work in the school system. They'll work in government offices. A huge employer of us, uh, our graduates in Austin. Uh, and they will actually build better systems because they can and because they believe in doing it. And I think we've got to push this kind of value center design much harder. We've been way too passive with it and we need to get aggressive. And we need to be researching the very experience of this information space that human beings have. Human beings have, all of us, every one of us, and what that space is going to be like. I'd be remiss and I'd get uh, ticked off by people when I go back to Austin if I fail to mention that we're about to launch a new master's program in identity management directly as a result of uh, some of the work that I've been doing here and a partnership with the Center for Identity at UT, which was created, interestingly enough, with state money, imagine that, in Texas, for education. Uh, is this being recorded? Uh, I may have just signed my resignation letter. Uh, um, uh, well, it was the old administration. So, uh, um, so we, you know, we've... Uh, yeah, there was a sense in which the government officers particularly, uh, government employees, the government agencies were saying, how, how, can we be, how do we know that we can be secure? How do we know we can protect this stuff? I know. We'll go to UT and they'll tell us how to do it. And uh, that's sort of what's happened. So we've created a new program which will start next year. And we're going to produce, particularly in the identity management area, professionals who uh, share the sort of value structure that we're talking about. It's the only model I know. I've been in academia all my life. I only know the pace of change that comes in the academic, which is glacial, I'll admit. <laughs> but, you know, only by educating new people who can go out there and do this stuff do I think we can affect the kind of change. So I wanted to mention that, and I realize time is running out. I promise I would take questions if you have any. Thank you for staying. To be the lunchtime speaker on the last session it was really not my choosing. Well, you know how persuasive uh, uh, Deb can be. Uh, but actually, I'm delighted to be here. I've really, really enjoyed the summit, as I always do. I, I never really get to a collection of uh, papers and sessions and discussions quite like this one. It's a very, very different energy here and a very, very different sort of collection of people. And I'm proud of what you're all doing. And I s stand ready to deliver professionals who take the dream of this group forward uh, into, the, into the future. And that's what we need to do. All of us need to do to stand up for your rights in the information space and agitate. Thank you. Well, somebody must have a question for Andrew, at least about Ireland or something. <laughs> okay, good. Our lawyers. <laughs> Okay, so the, 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 the question largely is that with the sort of, uh, the way retention seems to work for most uh, organizations, I guess, companies that collect data, is that they're just collecting everything and they don't really have a, a thought out uh, sense of what's the life cycle endpoint here and how, how do we, I'm probably putting words in your mouth here, Lucy, but, so correct me if I get that wrong. Uh, uh, but the, this is also leaving us more and more vulnerable to breaches uh, as a consequence. Is that true? I think it's inevitably true. Uh, but I do think there actually are some movements in the retention uh, community. So particularly Iron Mountain, for example, big, big company. We do a lot of work with Iron Mountain. And they are very, very interested in, in developing uh, new models of uh, records management, which take account of not only security, but appropriate sort of decommissioning and uh, end of life cycle, retention cycle sort of activity. And, but they also think you know, we need to educate, again, a new, a new generation of records managers to sort of do that. And I, I fully agree. I think, I think we do need to do it. But your bigger point is, are we increasing our own trouble? But are, we, are, we, are we storing up um, you know, weaknesses for attack in the future? Yeah, I think that we definitely are. I think we definitely are. And curiously enough, I don't think 10 years ago people would even have thought that was going to be a problem. 
now, I see, but we're going to see new problems like this all the time. Adrian. Andrew. Andrew, you didn't mention in your talk how the um, information technologies are invading our bodies. <laughs> Something that was mentioned in the no. topic. And if we change our genes, it's going to be even hard to say what's human anymore. There was one, one geneticist who said, our cells are just squishy parallel processors. <laughs> so I want you to comment on how that's going to be. Well, you know, there is, there's the... Okay, so I have to repeat for the taping. Uh, I didn't talk about uh, sensor technologies and particularly in-body technologies, which may change us as uh, change the very nature of our hu human existence, I suppose, in some ways. You know, I have a, I have a, an in I have an, a slightly left-field take on this. I mean, I, there, there is a strong belief actually out there uh, by intelligent people that we are on the verge of being cyborged. It's just inevitable. That's the way we're going to go. And that what we want to watch out for is, uh, well... The big companies that are behind this, their, their stance on it is, don't worry, we'll all kind of sign a manifesto that if we create these sort of artificial forms of life, they'll actually be benign. So it'll be like kind artificial intelligence merged with humans. I think this is, you know, this, you know, this is, you know, go back to World War II and waving peace in our time just before Hitler invades. It's that kind of naivety. It's just not, you know, this, this, the world isn't going to wait for that. I'm not sure that we will turn... I'm less worried that we'll turn into cyborgs. I'm more worried that artificial intelligence capabilities will outgrow our ability to control what they do. And if you make something that's even cleverer than us, there's no guarantee that it's not going to be meaner than us. And uh, I actually, you know, it's sort of science fiction scary stuff, and I'm a rational scientist. I like to look at the data, but... I'm increasingly reading stuff from very, very intelligent members of the AI community that give me pause about where, where this stuff is going to end up. Okay, so the question about the new program that we're starting in identity management, why is it not called privacy management? I don't actually have a very good answer for that. I think we like the acronym MSIMS. Well, but, uh, I, I really, I do think it sort of came down to not having clarity of that. I suspect, though, the deeper question, why not call it privacy? I think privacy management might actually scare people more. I think identity management actually sounds a bit more neutral. Uh, now, you might read that another way. I don't know, but I, you know... I'd have to ask people who market this sort of stuff you know, where, where that came from. Um, so not the best answer to that. But, uh, no, the serious question being, is there in your mind, never mind how you market it, right. any difference between a program that you have to imagine and a program that I don't see a difference. No. No. Any more? I think our time together has come to an end. <laughs> Thank you. You were fabulous. Uh, I've already been asked for his slides. We'll definitely have them for you. I know you'll want to tell some of those stories too. Thank you so much. Um, wow, it's uh, we're at the end. This has been a wonderful time together. It's so much fun for me. I hope you had a wonderful and intellectually stimulating time. And. Um, I wish we could tell you what the dates are for next year, but you, you have to keep in mind it'll be the first or the second week of June because Georgetown doesn't assign dates until the fall, and we will keep begging them to give us sooner answers, but you'll know as soon as we know. So just this, we're trying to keep this time frame, which seems to be really good for academics and for most people. So thank you again. Fill out your evaluations. Tell us what you think. I've, I've already been hearing some things like, Maybe a little less dense information, a few more networking breaks, times to talk. Uh, you know, be creative because we want to we want to serve you and not be too overwhelming with <laughs> with wonderful people, so that we have time to appreciate all of them. Thank you. I, I thank you for making this possible, all of you. Thank you.